Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Rene Nahed. I am the Director of Public Health and the Director of the History of Vaccines Project for the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. I am talking today with Dr. Jonathan Howard, an Associate Professor of Neurology and Psychiatry at NYU Langone Health and the Chief of Neurology at Bellevue Hospital. His book is this book right here, We Want Them Infected. It is available now from Red Hawk Publications. Wherever books are sold, like on Amazon with a Kindle and audio version coming soon, you can follow him on Twitter at 19JOHO, 19JOHO, if you feel so inclined to venture into Twitter right now and take a look. Dr. Howard, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate your time. Oh, thanks so, for, so much for having me. I was looking at this book and I, I was telling you earlier, when I got this book, I was like, this is a lot of reading right here. And I, I do like reading, but this much is references, which I really appreciate. But I wanted to go to the back of the book and it says he has been interested in vaccines long before the pandemic. So psychiatry and neurology, how did you get interested in vaccines? So I got interested in vaccines starting in about 2010 after a doctor who I trained with here at New York University, a woman by the name of Dr. Kelly Brogan, morphed into one of our country's most famous outspoken anti-vaccine doctors before the pandemic. And she is smart. She went to Cornell. She went to MIT. She trained here with me. She's the only doctor I mentioned in the book who I've met and we were friendly. I haven't spoken to her in about 10 years, but she started posting anti-vaccine content and it just kind of really caught me off guard. And at the very beginning, I couldn't refute her ideas. I didn't know what she had gotten wrong, but I became so curious about it. I learned everything that I could about the anti-vaccine movement and how to refute their arguments. And I was unfortunately very well prepared for this pandemic. Yeah, I, you know, one of the things about the pandemic is that it really brought out the anti-vaccine people from everywhere and anywhere, right? It brought them together, I guess, both the pandemic and the availability of social media. And you have a social media account. You've seen some of this stuff. And a lot of what you cover in the book, right, comes from social media. So tell us a little bit about the book. How did you get the idea for it? How did you put it together? Because from all those citations, there was a lot of work involved. Well, thanks. I'm glad that you noticed the citations. It was important that people be able to fact check me and just make sure that I'm not making things up as I go. I got the idea for the book about a year and to the pandemic, once vaccines became available, I started noticing anti-vaccine content coming from surprising sources. So things that Kelly Brogan and an anti-vaccine doctor said about measles and polio and the HPV vaccine, the way that they minimized those viruses, minimized the diseases that they cause, and fear-mongered, maximized every one in a million rare vaccine side effect started coming out of the mouth of mainstream doctors from Harvard, from Stanford, from the University of California, San Francisco, from Johns Hopkins. And unlike Kelly Brogan, they weren't just speaking to the converted. These people had huge platforms, not just on social media, but in the mainstream newspapers, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, and on television, Fox News, for example. And I was just stunned to see doctors repeat her anti-vaccine arguments. And for the past two years, I've been just been collecting all of their statements, all of their misinformation, all of their poorly aged predictions. And I finally just decided to put it all together in a book. And we want them infected is the result. And we want them infected. The title of the book does not come mm -hmm. from me. It comes from an epidemiologist. And the title is to be taken very literally. There was and there still is a movement to purposefully infect unvaccinated children, young adults, and even middle-aged adults with COVID. So it's kind of the idea of the chicken pox parties amplified to a, a very dangerous level, right? Because even chicken pox parties, I have some family history of my own where we had a party when I got sick. And that unfortunately ended up in at least one cousin with a neurological disorder that made them lose their hearing. So there are risks involved with that. You know, the, the family now says, had we had the chicken pox vaccine back then, you would have gotten the vaccine and that would have been the end of it instead of putting everybody at risk. But that is, again, anecdotal evidence. And I think a lot of what you cite in here, it goes beyond the anecdotal, right? It's like anecdotal plus. So based on flimsy, if any, science, you have some people who should know better recommending some interesting ideas. So what are some of those interesting ideas that you've seen, if not the top three, like most outlandish idea that these folks who should know better have been putting out there? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. It was an idea for a giant chicken pox party, which I was sent to, by the way, as a kid. Yeah. And chicken pox parties make sense in a world, number one, without vaccines and for a virus where you get it once and you're immune and the virus is more benign for children. And COVID really 
he only ticks off one of those three boxes, it definitely is more benign for children than it is for 80 year olds with diabetes and high blood pressure. But there is a vaccine available for it. It's not a perfect vaccine. It has many flaws, but it's better than nothing. And we all know that one infection does not lead to permanent immunity. So I think doctors treated COVID from day one, some doctors at least, like it was a very well-known virus that it was predictable. A lot of the quotes are from doctors basically turning into cheerleaders for the virus, writing articles such as the triumph of natural immunity or tweeting natural immunity wins again. So I think this idea that you could get rid of COVID by spreading COVID and really the book explores the obvious flaws in that thinking. Although the doctors who came up with that plan still insist that they're right. Yeah, and that is one of the things, right? You talked earlier about speaking to the converted or preaching to the choir, and that there does seem to be a sentiment of us versus them, uh, tribalism, that we see in many other aspects of culture, not just in the U.S., but around the world, the us versus them, the old adage of me against my brother, my brother and I versus my cousin, you know, my brother, my cousin and I versus everybody else, the other, the outsider. And you see that split here in the book. Did you identify any specific groups? So we talked about doctors, right? But were there others who were kind of amplifying this misinformation? Yeah, well, I talk about doctors because I've always had a sort of a thing for anti-vaccine doctors. And I just want to make very clear that with a couple of exceptions, none of the doctors who I talked about actually treated COVID patients. They were completely sheltered from the consequences of their words. Unlike me, I worked throughout New York City's COVID experience, which was only really bad three years ago. I think the rest of the country after that had it relatively easy compared to us. And yeah, their ideas were amplified. As I said, they were widespread in the media. They became pandemic celebrities. You can look up their names on YouTube. They have hundreds of videos. They met with President Trump. Scott Atlas became his coronavirus czar, and he was one of the, uh, the, the lead proponents of spreading the virus as widely as possible. They influenced Ron DeSantis. They influenced Glenn Youngkin, the governor of Virginia. And anytime on Twitter, you see someone spreading conspiracy theories that people were dying with COVID, not of COVID, that death certificates couldn't be trusted, that people were dying from lockdowns, that doctors killed patients through premature intubations. All of those ideas either came from doctors, again, top-notch doctors at Stanford, for example, world-famous epidemiologists either originated some of those conspiracies at the very start of the pandemic, or at the very least, amplified them. So there's a lot of highly credentialed, well-spoken doctors who can speak in scientific jargon, spreading myths and misinformation, throwing frontline healthcare workers under the bus. You know, to play devil's advocate, that would be one of the arguments, right, of like, well, How is it that these experts in their fields, these people with advanced degrees, with medical degrees, they all have this stance. So why are they wrong? Right. And and you go into it in, in the book with all the evidence that you show. But why are they wrong? Well, they were wrong because they predicted, some of them, that COVID would kill about 40,000 Americans at the start of the pandemic. So I want to be very clear that I don't think I'm arguing with people who have sort of heterodox positions about nuanced takes, for example. Would either of us were kind of middle-aged dudes, you know, let's say we've had three vaccines. Let's say we've had COVID twice by now. I'm just making this up. Would we benefit from a booster? I don't know. You know, so I'm not here to argue the subtleties. Again, these are people who predicted that COVID would kill one out of a thousand Americans. And they did so well after it was very clear that the virus was more deadly than that, or they said it was much more benign than the flu. And so even though they had credentials, they just got these basic facts wrong repeatedly. Or they said someone who had COVID is going to have natural immunity strong that will powerfully protect them for years into the future. And obviously they turned out to be wrong about that. And instead of just admitting air, I mean, I want to be clear, a lot of people underestimated COVID at the start of the pandemic, you know, including myself at times. It's not just nitpicking people who got this wrong or that wrong. It's just a year long pattern, a three year long pattern of saying COVID is nothing to worry about. It only affects grandma and it's all going away. Yeah, you know, I guess if your grandma, you're kind of looking at them kind of skeptically, right? Like, yeah, why would you do that to me? I marked here about the allegory. Let me read it real quick. In 2019, the American Academy of Pediatrics launched a campaign to prevent children from drowning. And then you have there what the AAP said. And you're right. It would have been odd if someone used the fact that 73 million children don't drown annually to oppose AAP's attempts to stop 1,000 children from dying this way. That is, I guess, something that we in public health face all the time. The 
inability of the human mind to weigh risk properly. People are afraid of flying sometimes to the point that they will not get on an airplane. However, they will drive at excessively high speeds on the highway because they don't measure the risk accurately. How do you see some of these players in the book that you talk about taking advantage of that inability for humans to weigh risk properly? Sure. So the reason that I quoted the American Academy of Pediatrics there is people would try to minimize COVID impact on children and young people by essentially saying, look at the tens of millions of people who didn't die. So the death risk of COVID is going to be 0.00001% or whatever it is. But that's true of basically anything that kills children. Most children, fortunately, don't die. So you could use that, you know, 0.0001% to minimize the deaths of children who die in car crashes, of suicide, of drowning, of fire prevention. And we generally go to great lengths to keep children alive. We have fences around pools. We have swimming lessons. We have floaties. You know, every parent watches their kid like a hawk when they're swimming, except for guns. Guns is the other exception where we're willing to tolerate children's deaths. So, so people spoke about COVID in a very, very, very different way than they spoke about really anything else that could kill children. You know, and it's true that COVID is not the number one killer of children. And they said, essentially, so, so who cares? Well, that's ridiculous. It's the only killer of children that can basically be prevented, uh, not completely, but almost completely, with two or three injections. If I could vaccinate my children against car crash deaths, I would do it. If I could vaccinate them against drowning or fires, I would do it. Unfortunately, those sorts of catastrophes are actually much, much, much harder to prevent. But people were unwilling, doctors were unwilling to advocate for pediatric vaccination. And a matter of fact, they worked extremely hard and extremely successfully to undermine pediatric COVID vaccines with resultant needless suffering and needless death. So just finally here, you know, we often talk about the people who are not anti-vaccine, but they are more vaccine hesitant. They're sitting on the fence. And what tips, if any, would you have for parents going online into social media, which I don't recommend anybody get their medical information from social media, but this is the world we live in. So if you had somebody who is vaccine hesitant or just has questions about vaccination, what tips would you give them about using social media to get information about vaccination? Listen to doctors who had and have real world experience treating this disease. Listen to doctors who have skin in the game and listen to the doctors who have consequences for their work. I don't treat children. I'm not a pediatrician. But if I had successfully convinced large people in my community not to get vaccinated, that would mean more patients for me to treat or my colleagues at least to treat. I really only was a core COVID worker at the start of the pandemic. Uh, so listen to pediatricians because if they give you bad advice and your child gets sick, they will be the ones in the hospital treating your child. Don't listen to sheltered people who have made a bazillion YouTube videos and will not have any real world responsibility for the consequences of their words. All right. My guest today was Dr. Jonathan Howard, Associate Professor of Neurology and Psychiatry at NYU Langone Health and the Chief of Neurology at Bellevue Hospital. Again, I highly recommend you go out and get this book or order it online. We want them infected. It's an interesting read for people who want to know how the misinformation and disinformation was spread online and by whom and really look at the counter evidence We're very well put out and cited throughout the whole book. Dr. Howard, thank you so much for your time today. And I really appreciate your work and I appreciate you putting together this book. Oh, likewise. And thank you so much for your kind words. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you.